we um, I now so very thank you to the EMMS for inviting me to to, to give this talk. Um, as um, the title might say, um, mainly going to talk about how to use fundamental science, how to learn from physics or chemistry to improve uh, functional coatings, that is coatings which have a certain functionality, whether they are antibacterial or um, anti-corrosion or etc. Any other property that you want to um, improve. Um, and one of the main ways that we are going to do this, or the, one of the main ways we've been doing this through the past um, at least three, four years, is by doing what you see in the background, just, just playing with a pool of balls and seeing how they assemble, how they can be structured into a coating, and how can we control that architecture and that structure. So I think as a, I see, okay. So Simon mentioned a bit uh, my trajectory. I'm just going to very briefly mention more or less what, what he already um, said. So I, I was born in, in Spain uh, and then I, I did my degree in materials physics and an MSc in, in, in plastics. And then after that, I, I kept on working in polymers and I, I got a PhD in 2013 on nanostructural polymer films, very heavy on characterization techniques, etc. But more from a very fundamental uh, science point of view. But it was when I moved to the UK um, in 2014 to the to work in the group of Professor Joe Kerry at the University of Surrey when I started to look into more applied science. So in that case, I was still using polymer materials, but I was looking into colloidal polymers, so more particles, um, polymer particles in dispersion and how they form a film. And in that particular project was a European project to work um, uh, to produce corrosion resistant coatings. So after that, I took up uh, Vice Chancellor's Fellowship at Loughborough University, and there is where I started working more into the antibacterial coatings um, point of view or the anti-abrasion coatings point of view, which is what I'm going to be mainly talking in, 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 in today. Um, so then afterwards, after about four years working on this, then I was awarded a UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship, which I will briefly mention at the end of, of the talk, which is basically trying to solve some of the innovation challenges that are involved in developing new functional coatings. And I'm also a senior lecturer at, at the Department of Materials. This is just for, for reference, as, also as, as it is being recorded, I guess it's not a bad idea to leave them there. These are the main references that I will go through, the main papers. The first two are how everything kind of started, uh, the process for structuring coatings that I will be talking about. And the last three are three papers that we have published this year on how to use this process for um, developing functional coatings. So, watching paint dry. Especially in the UK, this is this is an expression that is used for something that is really boring, something that is quite unattractive and um, that wouldn't really give you much interesting things. But I think with my career, I have kind of realized that it is really interesting and there are lots of things that we still don't understand about the process of watching paint, right? So it's, it's not a bad idea to spend some hours um, watching paint dry and learning about it and in fact I've been doing this for, for quite a few years and I have to say that it is interesting so hopefully by the end of the talk you you might realize or you might agree with me at least partially that watching paint dry has some excitement into it and um, this is the, the the outline of the talk today um, some of the slides might be a bit technical um, happy for you to stop me or to ask any questions either during the presentation or afterwards um, but I'll try to kind of emphasize the, the, the basic things as well without you needing to worry too much about uh, everything, every detail that is on the uh, on the slides. So I will start first by describing how coatings form um, when they are uh, formed from uh, drying dispersions of polymer colloids. Then I will talk about this process that we discovered on how you can self stratify or form a, a coating which has two distinct layers as it dries. And then how we, have we been harnessing this method to develop antibacterial coatings and abrasion resistant coatings? And afterwards, I will start talking a bit about the innovation challenges that this represents when you want to take this process to the market, when you want to uh, try to develop a real product um, with these uh, fundamental science. And then I will go into some conclusions and outlook. 
how um, does uh, a paint or a coating um, form, a, a paint film or a coating form? So the first thing we need to look at is what are the different components of paints and coatings. So as you can see, um, for paints and coatings, a, a, a large amount of that is, is there's quite a lot of water in there. Um, and there's just a little bit of solvents because of the regulations are, are getting more and more strict. Um, but then what we have is quite a lot of additives, which are mainly um, rheology modifiers that make the, the, the paint be more thick, for example. And we have wetting agents with, which let the paint spread much better. And we have many other additives um, which can be added in small amounts. Then we have the pigments, which is, um, as, as, as the name says, they, they, they give the color uh, to the to the coating. And then we have the binder, which is the one of the most important ingredient of paint. So what is the binder? You might have guessed by what I was saying before, but the binder is these polymer particles in water, which basically are what binds everything together. That's what's given the, the consistency to the coating um, and, the, and it's binding all the other ingredients together into a coating. So this, uh, the, the process of, of these polymer particles in water, which are called latex, um, a latex dispersion, and the, the drying of latex and its field formation is key to many uh, uh, products. And we are talking about not only paints, but like I said, um, uh, corrosion, anti-corrosion coatings. We are talking about um, protection, seed protection coatings, enteric coatings for for tablets, etc. So the, it is, it, it, um, it is expand, it, it, it it takes a lot of um, of fields and different products that latex is, is completely crucial and key. So what? how does that process um, happen? So we have initially our polymer particles in dispersing water, and then the water starts to evaporate. So as water evaporates, particles start to get close packed. They, they, they get close packed, hexagonally close packed, and the water completely evaporates. After the water is gone, um, due to surface tension, etc., we have particle deformation. So the particles, because they are soft, they tend to fill in the voids in between them. And at some point, because they are polymer particles that can interdiffuse in between those boundaries, they just form um, a homogeneous coating um, all, all around. But still, despite seem to be not a completely um, extremely complex process, there's still quite a lot of open questions in this um, on latex film formation. So for example, there is one which I won't talk about here, but um, all these particles to be dispersed in water, they need to be stabilized by hydrophilic substances such as surfactants, etc. And one of the main challenges is to know what happens during film drying with those very hydrophilic substances because they might hinder the performance of the coating. So for example, do they go to the top surface? Uh, or do they just accumulate in the boundaries in between particles? But this is um, something that, for example, I, I left you a reference there, and we did a nutrient scattering um, a study on where do these hydrophilic substances go. So if you're more, if you're interested in that uh, topic, you, you can just look up that reference. But one of the main, one of the other open questions, and the main one that I'm going to address in this talk, is what happens if instead of having just one particle size, we have two different particle sizes? So imagine you have small particles and large particles. So you have your green and your red particles. So what happens after drying? Do we get all the small particles at the top or do we get all um, a homogeneous distribution, small and large particles everywhere? Or do we have a lateral separation, phase separation of, of the large ones and the small ones? So all these are questions that we've been trying to address in, in the past few years. And one of the things that can happen is the stratification, which is basically size segregation during drying, where you have one size of the particles at the top and another size of particles at the bottom. I'll just show you an example of, for example, these were some simulations that my colleague um, Andrea Fortini did um, a few years ago, where he was modeling the drying of large and small particles in a dispersion. So he had this box that you can see here, and basically what we are going to see, this will be the whole box. Imagine this is a layer of paint that is drying. And then here we're just going to follow the top surface and you will see how the particles move around while they are drying. So I'm going to see if, if this video works. Hopefully it will. Um, point of okay. 
broken. You need to change the arrow key if you press Control yeah, it, it, A. It's broken now, yeah. Thank yeah, you. It's Control A and Control L swaps between arrows and laser. So okay. Press control L. Yeah. Oh, that's a good trick. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so you can see from the very beginning. At the beginning, you start with a homogeneous distribution of small and large particles. But from the very beginning, you see that the small particles, which are the yellow ones, start to accumulate at the top. So this is the air water interface. And you can see there is a tendency for the small particles to accumulate at the top and form a layer there, and that stays there. So we have a system that spontaneously self-stratifies. It, it forms two layers without us needing to deposit one and then the other. So you just blend them in a dispersion, dry them, and then you end up with a coating which has um, the small particles at the top. And this seems to be quite reproducible um, for different um, number ratios, mean, means the amount of large versus the amount of small particles, etc. And also the, 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 the size ratio between the two particles. But obviously this is this is simulation and simulation, everything was perfectly fine and experiments. This is a bit more tricky, but still the idea is really good of having a system where you can control the small particles to go to the top. And then if you want, you have a functionality, for example, the small particles are able to kill um, a virus, as, as it is very trendy, you might want them to what you, you want them at the top. So you want to optimize the amount of small particles, functional particles that are at the top. And with this process, you will be able to um, optimize the performance of, of, of your coating. So um, what I did here was check experimentally that this process happened and then I blended particles which are the large particles are, have a, a red fluorescent dye and the small particles don't have um, any dye so they are they are unlabeled and then what I did is blend them together in different uh, number ratios and then after drying the film then I will look using atomic force microscopy at the top and using confocal microscopy at the inside of the coating to be what would be the distribution of the large particles which have a red dye. So you can see that when we have only a few uh, small particles, so only 10 small particles per each large one, the top surface just shows that we have um, just large particles. Whereas, and, and also if we look inside, we can see that distribution of large particles is very homogeneous in height. It doesn't barely change. Um, just the comment, the green is just the marker of the top surface. It doesn't mean that it's a different particle. So if we increase the amount of uh, small particles, then we can see that the top surface changes. So we don't see the large particles anymore. We see just the small ones. So we have the small ones dominating. And then when we look at the inside, the architecture inside the coating, we see that at the, at the, at the top, we have small particles because we see this black area here from the unlabeled small particles. And if we include even more small particles, this area becomes thicker and we still don't see any at the top. So and this was the, the experimental demonstration of, of how this stratification happened. Um, and then the way in which we explain, which I'm not going to go into detail, but basically we have um, an accumulation of a gradient in, in concentration of particles. Um, yeah, control L, that was good. So a gradient in um, concentration of particles from the top is really high to the bottom, which is really low. So this is pushing all the particles down, but because the large particles have a larger area, the pressure on those is larger, and then they go faster to the bottom. So that's how we explain how they segregate. And then this was quite quite a big thing, so we, we were quite happy with the response with this. We, we, we got it into BBC News and, and lots of other outlets, although we noticed that there was a bit of, let's say, irony into some of them, um, especially in the use of quotation marks, such as saying that watching paint dry leads scientists to an exciting new discovery, or watching paint dry reveals something very interesting, if you look closely enough. So, I mean, we, we, we got some in there, um, but but obviously I, I don't think they, they completely believe us that there was something absolutely great um, about this. So we asked what, what, what could be next after this? And then we said, well, we can, can we switch this on and off? Can we, can we make a system that stratifies or doesn't stratify as, as we um, desire? So in collaboration with some chemists at the University of Lyon, they, they designed some very fancy particles which are responsive to pH. So they have some polymer chains on the surface, which for low pH, they are collapsed. 
and for high pH they extend, so their size changes quite a lot with pH. And we blend this again with the same large particles. And in this case, we also label um, green the, the, the small particles. So you can see here, um, this is the, the, the size of the small ones in green. So the small particles, uh, when you change pH, you increase it to about 10 or 11, and they go, they double the size from 50 nanometers to 100 nanometers, and the large ones more or less remain constant. So what we, what, what I did again is, is blend these two particles, um, and just keep the amount of particles constant, but just change the pH. And again, I looked at the top using atomic microscopy and at the inside of the coating using confocal microscopy. So when we have low pH, and in this case, the green is really the small particles, we have stratification. We have small particles at the top, we have large particles at the bottom, the top surface looks only small particles. If we increase the pH to four, it still looks like we have stratification. We still have green on top, right at the bottom, but we start to see a few large particles at the top surface. But when we go into um, pH 9.5, then we see that that green layer is not present anymore, and the AFM is saying that we have lots of large particles at the top. So we have increased the size of the small particles, and that has resulted in this stratification uh, disappearing. So why did this happen? And the, the main reason is just basically that the jamming of the dispersion, which is, is, is just when the particles cannot move anymore, that happens earlier when we have less space available. So when we have larger, small particles, then we have less space available initially. We have less time for drying, and therefore all those factors makes this size segregation more difficult to happen. So we um, we have kind of somehow hindered the stratification, and we can just change switch it on and off just by changing the pH of the initial dispersion. So we, when in fact, uh, my colleague Andrea again, he did some modeling and he, he had a look at the film when it was stratified, when there's small particles on the top, and then he was changing the size of the small particles, increasing it, and then he was measuring the width of this stratified layer. And you can see that at some point, this width is reduced to almost zero when you increase the this, which is increasing the same as, as increasing the pH, and then you end up with a homogeneous film. And he saw that the stratification is lot, lost exactly for the same particle size as in the experiments that I have done. So this was a very good way of correlating. But this is then another tool of, well, we have this stratification, but we can switch it on and off um, as we think um, we need it. So this was, like I said, this, these two first works that we published in 2016. And then since I've been at LAFPRA, I've, I've been working and my team has been working on um, how to make an application out of out of these processes and we started with antibacterial coatings so the I, I don't think nowadays i need to emphasize the importance of antimicrobial surfaces initially when i started this it was more uh, related to antibiotic resistance um leading to to to, to like no common infections that can lead to uh, lead to really um, bad complications etc and also healthcare associated infections but nowadays after all um, the importance that we see that the, the virus transfer via high touch surfaces, it is even more evident that we need more effective antimicrobial surfaces. And this stratification mechanism, I think, is, is a good way of, of, of fighting that, that war in terms of that it, is, it works in water, which is good from an environmental point of view. It also optimizes the amount of antimicrobial material that goes to the surface if we make it small enough. Uh, and then also, because we get a lot of material at the surface, we can minimize how much material we need. So that, in principle, should reduce the cost. And all this work has been done by, by my student, Ethan each and, each and Um all this first part on, on antibacterial coatings. So um, what it did was uh, blending, again, we, we're talking about large particles, latex particles, which form a film, and then she blended them with zinc oxide nanoparticles, which are bactericidal. Um, these, these particles, I, I paint them spherical, but single oxide nanoparticles have, have, have a shape which is, which is definitely not spherical, as you can see there. And although um, the, the nominal size was 40 nanometers, um, we have two peaks here, which are 40 nanometers, maybe is in between those, those two peaks. But still, 
um, we, we have follow a similar procedure and then we blend the, uh, each and blended all these um, zinc oxide and latest particles with different concentrations of zinc oxide. And then what she did is, and, and this is something that you will see over and over during the talk, is play with how fast we evaporate that coating. So she, she had different concentrations. This is the, the, the volume that is occupied by the zinc oxide in the dry film, so 4%, 17%, 29%. And these are different evaporation rates. So fast evaporation rate is, is, is drying really fast under an infrared lamp. Medium evaporation rate is just letting it dry in a normal indoor environment. And slow evaporation rate is letting it dry in a really high humidity chamber. It's about 95% about relative humidity, which takes several days to dry versus a couple of hours or three hours in the indoor conditions. So what she saw is that when you blend zinc oxide, and these are again atomic force microscopy images, and what she showed is that basically when, when you have enough zinc oxide, um, what you start to see is because you can see the round things here, these are the latex particles, and then these features here, this is a structure that is just made of zinc oxide nanoparticles. So for enough concentration of uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles, we get a surface which is just covered by zinc oxide nanoparticles. We don't see any latex. It seems to be some kind of, like we call it, like a grid structure with some holes in there. And that's probably because the uh, latex particles underneath, they are templating those that, that structure. So she saw basically that, that she's, the zinc oxide is forming this structure, and these structures vary with how fast we are evaporating. In fact, um, if you look at the, the color scales, when we evaporate really slow, we get um, heights of about almost 200 nanometers. And then when we evaporate really fast, we only get about 68 nanometers. So the slower we, we evaporate, the taller these zinc oxide structures are. And then um, by doing image analysis, we, we were able to see how much zinc oxide um, is at the surface for different zinc oxide concentrations and different evaporations. And as you can see in the graph here, um, for the slow evaporation, rate what we see is that the, 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 we reach the highest surface coverage but not only the highest but also at the lowest zinc oxide concentration so it looks like the the, the slow evaporation seems to be um, reaching the, the, the better surface coverage by our uh, bactericidal agent but also it increases quite a lot the the, the roughness which might be also um, related and one thing we notice is that the contact angle of this really slow evaporated uh, coatings, it is somehow um, much larger. But I think in this case, what we are looking at is probably because when we are um, evaporating slow, you again, we have higher roughness, so we have higher contact angle. And then we have really slow, really low contact angle when we operate really fast. But this is also because when you evaporate really fast, you can see here an optical image, there are some cracks developing in the film. So that's what it's probably lowering down and uh, this um, this contour tangle and uh, water contour tangle. So the next thing we did is, OK, we have these structures of zinc oxide at the top, but do they kill bacteria? So we did a preliminary just some testing using um, E. coli. And what you can see here is just pictures of uh, an agar plate which has E. coli incubated in it. Now, basically, we put um, and th this round thing is our film, our antibacterial film on a glass light. We put it upside down on this agar plate and then we incubate E. coli. And what we see is that for our control sample, which is the uncoated uh, glass light, what we can see is that we have um, this, this, this yellowish tint is all the bacteria growing all the way to the rim of the glass. But when we add our antibacterial um, coating, then we can start to see that there is a bit of a space in between the bacteria and the coating. So it's inhibiting the growth. Uh, and also for slow evaporation, it's even larger. So here you have the, what they call the inhibition halo diameter, which is just this, this diameter here. And you can see that for slow evaporation rate, this halo is, is the largest of all of them. So we, we basically um, ascribe these to um, the larger height of, of the zinc oxide nanostructures and also a possible coffee ring effect, which is um, making the particles diffuse uh, or the zinc oxide particles, which are smaller, diffuse to the sides of the, of the drying coating. We, we came up with um, a model for 
um, how these structures form, which I, th I think I'm going to pass a bit. I'm just going to go to how we explain it finally, um, which um, which is this field formation model. So basically, we ended up um, explaining it by saying, well, we have a size segregation, like I was like I was saying before. We have this kind of um, stratification between large and small particles. Um, and, and this is what happens for all evaporation rates. So we start for the, the particles start to segregate. But what happens is that when you're evaporating really slow, then you have more time for these particles to segregate and you have more small particles on top of the of the large ones in the dispersion. Whereas when you're evaporating faster, these particles get trapped, the small ones in between the large ones. So when it evaporates completely for slow evaporation, you have quite a lot of small particles that are pushed on top of the large ones, and then they form these taller structures. But if you're evaporating faster, then you have less zinc oxide available at the top to form these structures. And that's why they don't have, uh, they are not as tall as the other ones. So this, the, so, so we, 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 we showed how these antibacterial coatings work, how can we use stratification to produce them, um, and we explained how they were formed. And then the next thing that we did was to try to say, okay, can we improve the, the, the resistance to abrasion of coatings? So again, why, why are abrasion, uh, abrasion, uh, why, why abrasion resistant coatings, why are they important? Well, in general, durability, not necessarily um, abrasion resistant coatings, but durability for any coating is, is quite important. Um, so you have um, you just want to prevent scratches and, and wear, etc to 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 make your painting cheap or, or go away. So um, and for example, this is very important also for conservation arts, etc. Um, and, and there was a project in Rembrandt's the Night Watch, which well, it is not um, it's not um, Jon Snow, but um, it is this very famous painting by Rembrandt. And then you can see all the cracks and they had a very big restoration project to to kind of bring it back to life somehow. So we need something that kind of protects it. And one of the things that is quite used in the in the paint in the paint industry is the use of um, um, silicon nanoparticles or metal metal oxide. So we thought we can try and see whether we can design some coating that resists abrasion um, using silicon nanoparticles. So we, um, in particular, this this is um, work from my student James and also uh, Alberto, which did some modeling on which I will show you now. So the idea is we start with a binary plane, which is just two sizes. We have our silica, small particles, our large latex particles, and then we form a film with that, and we see a, a structure similar to the one that we saw with the zinc oxide. So we have. All that you see at the top there, this is all silica nanoparticles. But we expect that there will be low surface stability because silica particles are hard; they don't bind to each other. So if there is abrasion, they will probably um, will be will will go away from the surface. So we said, okay, well, what happens if we add um, a second latex particle? So another soft particle which will sit on top of the large one and will bind to the small silica particles. So we have small, medium, and large. So if you blend these three together and make a film, you get, um, well, if you first blend just the two latex particles, you get similar structure, but you have the small soft particles at the top. If you add the third component, the silica, the silica goes on top of that, as we expected. So you have like kind of more or less like three layers of it. Um, and But we're expecting that having this smaller latex particle will enhance the, the surface stability of the silica, and it won't be rinsed off or, or braided off the surface as easily. So we um, we, we we did uh, the abrasion tests on the different uh, ones. So we have the binary, just the latex with the silica on top. If you abrade that for, for a while, we say 100 cycles using a felt pass, so it's, it's not really hard abrasion, but, but it's, it's some kind of wear on the surface. And you can see that after doing that, you basically remove all the silica. So you see that the very round features, which are just the latex particles and all the silica that was at the top is gone. If we have our ternary blend, which you can still see the silica structure at the top, we see that the, 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 the structure is still there. It's, it's maybe slightly lower, but it, the structure is still there. So, so adding this second latex population is definitely increasing the abrasion resistance. And if we anneal the the um, the, the ternary blend, then we, we have a similar um, result as well. 
So it looks like like this this could enhance the abrasion. So we uh, had a look at um, the, how, how much silica is gone after abrading using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. So we had a look, and then we said, well, binary. We went uh, after abrading from 20% to 10%, so it was reduced by 50%, which is very significant. Whether, whereas in the ternary, as you see, looking at the error bars, there was no reduction in the amount of silica that was at the top, really. And for the anil um, ternary plant, we have a, a very similar result. So this, this is a very positive result. We also tried to uh, assess the hardness, but uh, I think this wasn't the, the best type of test um, because um, the hardness in dental goes quite deep into the film. The film is not super thick, so I think it's testing more the whole film rather than just the surface or, the, or rather than just the top layer. So you can see that from the uh, binary blend and the abraded uh, binary blend, there's not much of a drop in hardness. Um, and for the tenary, there seems to be an increase. Um, but what we can clearly see is that when you anneal this coating, then the, the hardness increases significantly, which is expected because you have latex particles which are going to interdiffuse and, and have a better coalescence um, after um, uh, annealing. So we we were happy that, that this was another, um, an, another application that seems very promising. But then what it comes next is what are the innovation challenges? So it's like this this works really well in the lab, but what happens when you try to really develop this or, or apply it in, in the real world? So one of the things that we had in mind is what happens when you change the coating drying conditions? I already said that the how fast we evaporate or how fast we dry is really important in the process. So what happens, how, how can we ensure that um, this stratification method happens whether you are in a lovely day in, in London, raining and, and, and fog and wind, or if you are in Dubai um, in a really dry um, environment. So from this point of view, if, if you are in the very wet and humid, so you have low temperature, high relative humidity, so that means that the evaporation, it, it will evaporate much slower. And basically you will have more time for size segregation, but at the same time, this process where the particles get kind of trapped at the top while they're drying will happen um, less often. So it, it, it might also weaken this stratification process. On the other side, if we are in the desert, we have high temperature, low relative humidity, and then um, drying will be much faster. And in principle, you have shorter time for size segregation, but your air interface, air water interface will, will go really fast and it might um, it might trap more particles and improve the stratification. So, but we want something that could hopefully work for both of them. So we thought, well, um, what if we use polydispersed plants? And what I mean, what what do I mean by by this? So we have, um, we're saying, okay, we have um, maybe the small ones or the large ones will go to the top. We don't go, we don't know, depending on what are the ambient conditions. Um, but what if we put both the large ones and the small ones? as our functional coatings, and then we put another particle in between. So then it doesn't matter if it is the small ones or the large ones, because both of them are functional. So in, in all conditions, hopefully, they will be both at the top. So that's what we did. We had these uh, green particles, which have um, a, a certain anti biofouling component on the on the surface. And then we had um, this, uh, the, the red line is, is their particle size. So we have very broad particle size and below and over the one of our normal latex particles, which are here, they're a bit less polydispersed. But overall, it's polydispersed blend, but we have very large, very small, very large particles, which are the functional particles that we want at the top. So if we make films out of this, changing evaporation rate and how much of the functional particles we add, um, you can see that, and, and I can tell you by the sizes, that what you see when you have enough of these particles, so these are just like kind of the medium particles here, but when you have enough of the functional particles, all you see at the top is just the functional particles. Other than here that you see some of the medium particles, but all the rest, you have a small, very small, very large particles. So you're always having, a, um, the, 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 the functional particles are always dominating at the top surface, which is what we wanted. And this is happening for a wide range of evaporation rates. It doesn't matter if you evaporate fast or if you evaporate slow. You always have your functional particles there. 
So this system seems to achieve what we what we wanted. Um, the only thing that we wanted to look at is because if you just look at the AFM uh, images, you can add up the surface that is occupied by all the functional particles and then see how that changes with how much functional particles you add. But uh, in this case with AFM, you, we just see that it increases to a plateau to 100% and that's it. So we are just looking at the very, very top. So we said, okay, should we look at a bit thicker layer to see how evaporation rate uh, might affect because here it looks like it's not changing anything. So for that we use um, FTIR, so infrared spectroscopy, and with this we are looking at the first micron of of the of the coating, um, and then we are just basically following one of the of the functional groups which is related to our functional particles, and then we can see how much there is depending on 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 the amount of um, functional particles and depending on the evaporation rate. So we'll basically get this graph where, where we are seeing is that the amount of, of, of functional particles on that first micron layer is optimized when you're evaporating faster. In this case, it looks like you are trapping more particles at that first layer. Um, so we, we always have a high amount, but it looks like evaporating faster seems to be better. So it, it, it's overcoming this, this, this problem of different drying conditions. Um, because we always end up with the top surface, the very top surface with what we want to be there, but still the, the first layer is, is uh, it has some of the non-functional particles. Um, okay, so um, I think that, that was one of the challenges that we kind of tried to um, overcome, um, and, I, and I think we'll, we'll keep on working on that, but it was a, a good first step in how can we control um, this um, stratification in conditions where the evaporation rate is not really predictable, which is one of the main um, challenges when you're trying to develop a new coating um, in, for the market. And we also had a look uh, at the cross-section and, and SEM as well. This is just a bit of, of um, more or less the same as it's just kind of corroborating what we saw using infrared spectroscopy that for fast evaporation rate, we are just here looking at the cross-section from the side at the coating um, and this, this layer of small particles, which you cannot really see them because they are coalesced, is thicker than here, where you can see some medium particles are also going to the top. So that means that for fast evaporation rate, that top layer has more small particles, but we still see the stratification. We still have all these small particles at the top here and here. So it still seems it is still uh, making it a more reliable process than if, if we were using non-polydispersed blends. At the same time, polydispersed blends might be interesting even for paint manufacturers because, for example, that is using polydispersity and particles of many different sizes is one of the ways to be able to increase the concentration of your paint or your latex. If they are very monodispersed, you're not able to pack as many as, 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 as if they are polydispersed, so that might be even good from, from, from a practical point of view. So we talk about um, ambient conditions, how can we go around that, um, but we need to come back to coatings formulation, and this is just a bit of, of kind of an outlook of, of, of where we are going. Um, we said there are loads of other ingredients, um, and then, like I said, you have a list, and we've only been talking maybe about one of the additives, which could be this antibacterial additive, for example, or anti-corrosion, etc. But what happens when you add many of the others? So, so that is one of the of, of the main uh, challenges that we will be um, dealing with from now onwards, because there are some other things, like for example, rheology modifiers are, are quite important. Uh, because we are having in paints, when you open a can of paint, you can see it's a really thick paint. So we we need to look at how this rheology modifiers, which basically increase the thickness or the, or the, the, the viscosity of, of paint, how they interact with our particles, how they um, uh, how they affect this process of stratification. So that is that is one of the main challenges that we'll be looking into in the in, in future years and, and, and etc. So all these ingredients and it's not only that you have all the things you have pigments which are very large uh, compared with the size of the particles we're talking about things that are uh, micron size instead of nano size so the, the polymer particles are more like you like you've seen more 200 nanometers so pigments can be anything tens of microns or even more and um, so so how all these um, ingredients interact um, 
it is quite it's big challenge that we are hoping to address in in, in future years. So, um, like I said, in terms of what next, so we will basically this is just the project that um, I've just started this 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 month. So we are we what we are trying is is to deal with all this formulation or also scale up. So when you, for example, want to um, uh, you have a coating which is working in the lab, but you want to paint a photovoltaic um, installation and that is a solar panel that is in the middle of the desert, but it's I don't know 20 meters by 20 meters. So can you upscale that? Can it be still reliable, etc.? So all these formulation and scale up um, kind of barriers. Um, it, it is what what we're going to address in the next projects, and and this will be thanks to to UKRI. So this is my uh, future leaders fellowship, which is basically a scheme that um, enables um, long term flexible projects. So something like this, where you you are not very sure what you're going to run into. Uh, and, and you might need to change the way in which you are uh, trying to deal with with these challenges and also a, a very long term project. So we so the plan is to try to go through all this and try to use um, this process and upscale it and develop it and formulate um, the, the, the next kind of generation of, of functional paints and coatings. So we will be initially working on antibacterial coatings. So we, we are collaborating with um, microbiologists and um, and also the NHS as well to to to, to look at coatings for um, healthcare environments. But also we have in mind working on optical coatings probably to increase um, the um, to to reduce the soiling in solar panels and increase renewable energy production, etc. So we have gathered a really good um, team of of academics in 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 France and in Spain um, and in the UK as well. Um, and several paint companies manufacturers and we are hoping that this will be um, quite successful so, so I'll, I'll be happy to talk to anyone about, about any of this pro any of this application or if anybody has any other um, functionality in mind because the idea of this is that it could be applied to any other thing it's not necessarily just antibacterial or, or self-cleaning etc um, I'll, I'll be very interested to to, to discuss with you. Um, so, so just a bit of conclusions because I think, uh, yeah, I think that's not too bad at the timing. So we, um, I, like, like I was mentioning, so we have basically fabricated this, these films and we have stratified them by size. So we have large and small particles. We're able to get the small particles to the top, um, and then we have also designed a system that is able to, um, to suppress this process. Just basically by increasing the size of the small particles by increasing the pH. So it's quite a simple adjustment that could just result in, in having something that has one structure or the other one at will. Then the next thing we, we've been doing is, is just harnessing this process to, to develop two different applications successfully. And the first of, of, of them has been um, fabricating antibacterial films. Um, but this way we are able to optimize the amount of bactericidal or antibacterial agent and that goes to the surface. And in principle, you could also reduce how much you put into your coating and reduce cost. And then we have also um, developed abrasion resistant coatings so that you kind of enhance the surface stability of, um, of, of, uh, of coatings, which might be good also. There are also some concerns of um, the toxicity of nanoparticles, etc. So if we kind of use this concept, we will also reduce um, how, my, how many of these are released to the environment and, and to ourselves. We also have been looking into, into um, innovation challenge, uh, for example, uh, using um, what happens when you change how fast or, um, your coating dries depending on your environmental conditions. And we suggested the potential of, of using polydispersed particle blends, which seems to be um, quite successful. But like I said, there is quite a lot of um, challenges that remain. Um, and I'm very keen on, on keep on working on those. Um, and one of them, and the most immediate one is uh, immediate ones are uh, looking at what happens when we are using, uh, uh, let's say, pilot scale formulation with the main basic ingredients of a paint, or what happens when you want to scale this up to a large, um, a, a large area. So just I'll just finish with acknowledgements um, to everybody. I would like to thank everybody in my group, especially the main results that you have seen, all those three papers that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, which are done by James and uh, Anichen. 
Um, and then all the people at Loughra as well that I've collaborated with, uh, people from the University of Surrey, um, and also my uh, the polymer chemists that synthesize many things that um, we play with in the lab in France and in Spain, and especially uh, UKRI for, for, for my fellowship and EPSSC for funding. And, and that is it. And I'll just thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.